Welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today we continue our six-part series surveying some of the accomplishments of the Argentine cinema. Today we're going to be in the early 1960s with a film called Odd Number in English, or La Cifra Impar in Spanish, directed by Manuel Antin. This is an intriguing film because it has echoes in it of the European cinema of this, of this time, the cinema, that is, of Michelangelo Antonioni, the cinema of Anna René in France. It's adapted from a notable short story by Julio Cortazar, who, in fact, was responsible for Blow Up, made by Antonioni, several years uh, later. It's an intriguing story, and I think you'll enjoy it cinematically and as storytelling. Uh, after today's film, as usual, we'll have two guests, Professor Gregory Rabassa of the City University Graduate Center and Professor Jean Belveyada of Williams College. They'll be here to discuss this film. In the meantime, enjoy Odd Number. <laughs> In the Hi, welcome back to Cinema Then, uh, Cinema Now. Uh, you've seen a, quite an unusual film, one that has never been really screened on American television for a mixed English language and Spanish-speaking uh, audience. It's an important film from the history of Argentine cinema, from uh, an important director, and of course based upon a story by one of Argentina's uh, greatest authors, Julio Cortazar. We'll be talking about those issues and some others in the coming 30 minutes, but let me take uh, this moment to introduce to you uh, today's uh, two guests. Uh, sitting to my left is Professor uh, Jean Belviada. Uh, Jean teaches at uh, Williams College uh, and is the author of uh, notable works both on Borges uh, and on Garcia Marquez, uh, both published by University of Carolina Press. North, I think, plug, right. plug, plug, plug. Thank you. Uh, recently, uh, Jean's also uh, published a novel called The, Char the Carlos Chatsworth uh, Mystery. Chadwick. Chadwick. I knew that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, Jean has uh, spent time uh, in Argentina researching the background on these, on these matters. Uh, to my right is our second guest, uh, Professor Gregory Rabassa. Uh, Gregory teaches at Queens College of the City University and at the City University uh, Graduate Center. Uh, many of our uh, viewers uh, know Gregory Rabassa through his uh, translations of important um, uh, South American authors, including the translation of A Hundred Years of Solitude and of uh, Cortazar's uh, uh, large novel, uh, Hopscotch. Gregory, let's start with you because uh, you uh, knew Cortazar as his, uh, as his uh, translator. R remind us a little bit about who Cortazar was and what his place is in uh, contemporary uh, Argentine, but also contemporary South American literature. I think he's one of the uh, earliest to work into this group, uh, found the group, is what they call the boom. Right. Uh, actually, he's kind of a bridge between Borges, who comes late, and some of the younger ones. And Borges discovered him and published Julio first in his magazine, which is, I guess, why there was always a mutual respect between the two right. of them. And uh, then he uh, began to write Hopscotch, is one of his earlier works, actually, the second novel. And in it, if those who have read it see that it's, uh, it shook up the form of the novel very much. In other words, he, he pioneered form very much in his, uh, his writing. And the content 
is very close to what we was, what we saw in the movies, the switch between Europe, Paris, that is, and Buenos Aires, the two, the two scenes. He, he lived in Paris for he many years. He lived in Paris, uh, first uh, uh, voluntary exile, and then, of course, uh, for many years he couldn't go back for his own safety. Right, but, but this is a characteristic, uh, I mean, <laughs> there, are, there are jokes about meeting the Argentine intelligentsia uh, after Buenos Aires, New York, and Paris are two of the very best places in the world. Yeah, uh, in, this in is, the world. it was so, true, it still is true, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that sort of leads us over uh, to this whole question of, of, the, uh, of this as an, as an adaptation. Gene, you and I were chatting a little bit about uh, this, this story. This is taken from a, a specific story. Now, this story has not been translated into English. Not into English, no. Okay. And it's uh, Cartas de Mama? Yes, Cartas okay. de Mama, right. Okay. And so, um, what are some of the, let's just stick just for a moment with the, the, whole, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the whole translation. Uh, well, I said translation issue, but of course adaptation is a form of translation. I mean, yes. one can conceive of trans going from one medium to another, either as going from one language to another or going from right. one artistic medium uh, to, uh, to another. Let's just start with a simple uh, thing. What's similar? What's different? I mean, well, when Antin decided to take on this story, Cartas de Mamá, he had a tough one to work with because the story is very uh, much centered on Luis and the letters from mother. Uh, the letters are quoted in extenso. And in the story, the characters of Nico and Laura are very shadowy. They are hardly developed. They, they are more are, are sort of like supernumeraries to, to the larger situation. Uh, and the movie expands their characters uh, quite a bit. They are, they're equal in their depth to the character of Luis. So that, that, that's an expansion of the, of the original. But he also changed the spirit of the story quite a bit. The story, in many ways, is a kind of the domestic comedy. Okay. Uh, the very title suggests that something funny is going on in the family. And the story is very ironical and lightly comical throughout. There are many comic touches. Uh, Antin instead gave, uh, he, he shifted the focus and made it into a kind of a drama, an existential drama of alienation and loneliness, which isn't that much present in the story. So that was a major shift in the focus, uh, in, in the adaptation. Well, one of the things that, that I find distinctive about the film, we can talk about from a, uh, from a couple of angles, is the way in which there's a shifting narration uh, in, in the film. Now, really, most of the movies we see, and certainly those move, most of the movies made on the so-called Hollywood model have the equivalent of a 19th century omniscient exactly. um, narrator who sort of pokes around here right. or there. But this movie, dips in and out of the consciousness of, uh, of, uh, of the characters yes. in, in different ways. I, is that in, in the short story as, as, as well? Or? No, the story has basically two consciousnesses, that of Luis, who, uh, with to whom it's all filtered, okay. and then the letters from Mother, who, that are also filtered to Luis's mind. But the, the letters add a very comic touch. We hear all the gossip about Bobby the dog and the, the kids <laughs> next door and other things like that. It's almost a bit like sort of like a mild version of Samuel Beckett and his portrayals of old age, the, the, the letters from mother. But uh, other than that, it is basically Luis's consciousness. It is written in third person, the okay. story, but it is through Luis that the entire action takes place. Okay, well that's, you know, t to, uh, uh, um, to use an analogy not from Argentine literature, but from American literature, uh, Henry James's I mean, number yes. of his novels that are filtered through the consciousness of a single character are nonetheless written in the third, yes. in the third, in the third person. I mean, right. famously, in the ambassadors or what Maisie knew, okay. uh, things like that. And I, I, however, it's it's interesting to me that Cortazar in other works, uh, uh, you know, jumps among. Uh, a variety of yes. narrators or That's a variety right. of modes of narr narration. So uh, in that sense, this is true to the spirit of his overall work. Yes. I mean, if not to the letter of this uh, a, a particular, s particular story. Right. Um, I also find it uh, slightly more radical uh, to do that in, uh, in film. I mean, yes. uh, bec because we don't have a tradition, or how shall I put it, only at this period in film history, in the late 50s or early 60s, yes. is in the sound film this tradition of, of multiple forms of narration right. Right. Uh, you know, be really beginning to, right. to, 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 to develop. Exactly. No, in fact, Antin probably realized he had to do that because in the story, 
which is only 25 pages long, uh, the characters of Nico and Laura are so schematic that I figured I cannot make these characters this way. They have to have a full body of their own in the movie. That's the choice he made. For example, in the story, Nico is not a painter. He is, he is simply Luis's brother, who is weak, uh, weakly, uh, likes chess and stamps, and loves Laura, and that's it. There's nothing more to his character. He, 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 he's, he's very much in the background. Laura, too, is in, in some ways even more shadowy than, than Nico, so that he probably felt that you couldn't have uh, an entire movie filtered only through Luis's consciousness and have his own wife and brother be these extras. He had to do more than that. Yeah. And uh, that's how the movie ins uh, gains and is expanded by that choice. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things uh, about this uh, film is, is that introduction of the, of the painter into, this, uh, into the script version because it, it inherently foregrounds this issue of, of vision and of, uh, and of seeing. I was wondering, Gregory, whether, I mean, uh, whether or not uh, Cortazar had uh, a strong interest directly in the movies themselves, in the visual arts. I mean, it, as, as, you, as you knew him and also knew of these, uh, these interests. He is very much uh, what we'd call a man in many parts. In Hopscotch, for example, you'll notice that his characters uh, represent certain of the arts. There is a painter, there is a musician, yeah. as well as different nationalities. Uh, Julio himself played trumpet and knew jazz very well. In the, um, What's it called? El Perseguidor. I forget the English title. The Pursuer. Which is, the Pursuer, which was based on um, Charlie Parker right. and Bird. So he does have this all in there. What I was thinking, uh, Gene mentioned uh, the, uh, the story being a comic one. The, the first thing that struck me when I saw the film was that this is a Cortaza story and nobody smiled. Not through the whole, the whole movie. And of course, this idea of reduction, I think, was there too, which. Uh, um, you couldn't, it possibly could have been reduced more. I don't know whether it could have, but I went about the dialogue. Since the story didn't have dialogue, it right. was all letters, that the dialogue, uh, they seem to be having trouble with dialogue, and the expression, que te pasa, what's uh, wrong with you, kept coming up, and all of a sudden, it, about three quarters of the way through, I said, I would rewrite this <laughs> and make it more Cortazarian and maybe a little of Beckett, and just have one line which would be repeated, uh, I suppose, like uh, minimalist music through his, yes, right. his oh, que te pasa, que te pasa, uh -huh. and have no other dialogue but that. I right. thought that might be more in the spirit. Uh, I, right. You made me think of, of Beckett, uh, uh, I can't go on, I must go on. Yes, uh, right. <laughs> uh, that, that, that kind of uh, Beck, uh, Beckettian thing. That, this is, um, it, it's interesting uh, to me uh, what, what you just said because, uh, one of the features of a lot of uh, of a lot of film that with these kinds of narrative situations in them, I mean, of bet brothers betraying each other over a woman, uh, etc., is that a lot of people on telenovelas or whatever spend a lot of time talking about this all, all, mm -hmm. all the time. So while there is the intrusion of dialogue here that's not, say, in uh, in the story that's filtered through through a consciousness, at the same time there's a lot of of um, interiority here and there's a lot of people uh, uh, well there's this, this counterpointing of what they're thinking about with what they're in fact doing at yeah. that particular moment or also these these uh, strange driftings in it where where for a moment you don't know when for, you don't know who's being addressed you know is, Lu is, is Luis thinking about this and is Laura thinking about it simultaneously or is this or is or, or are they both somehow hearing the voice of Mama because Mama's presence and in turn that of Nico is haunting, um, uh, you, you know, their lives. Obviously, and that's <laughs> largely the the, but, the point of the matter. I think it's also the idea that comes over rather well in the film is the blending of people and place. Uh, that is, uh, with the quick transition, we're not sure. We, it takes us for a minute or two, a second or two, to realize. We're back in Buenos Aires. We're not in Paris. And also, from one person to another, you had just been used to Luis, and then suddenly you look, and that isn't Luis anymore. It's a little too thin. It's Nico, uh -huh. uh, right. yeah. uh, without any transition, which I thought was a good touch in the in the well, movie. Well, that's uh, there's this um, you know f from a certain set of um, 
I, I don't even give them the, uh, the benefit of calling them principles, but a certain set of rules of storytelling, you know, the sort of thing that one gets in a, a manual, how you can sell your, your, your short story. This goes against those, uh, absolutely goes against those rules because this is purposeful confusion. That is, it is a matter that, you, that, that part of the meaning, the, our experience of this, is that we're not supposed to know where we are for a, for a couple of seconds or whatever it is, or who the narration is being addressed to or coming, uh, or, or coming from. And that sort of breaks up <laughs> a sort of stable empirical world. This is the, uh, the role of the writer Morelli in uh, Hopscotch, who is never really a character, but his writings appear in the book. And he tells how a novel should be written. <laughs> and in a sense, after you finish the novel, you realize that uh, the author of Hopscotch is Morelli. <laughs> it's it's right. been done in his way. Exactly. Well, and of course, Hopscotch is, an, is a novel famous for its set of instructions at the end of the book on how to go back and reread the chapters in a different, uh, in a different, uh, in a different order. Uh, which, I mean, <laughs> obviously takes to pieces the notion that the pieces can only be assembled meaningfully in, um, in, in one way. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. You know, Gene, um, we've been talking about, in, uh, to sort of generalize, some of the, the modern features yes. of, uh, of this. And uh, we've been talking about, you know, the, uh, this narrative fragmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, this interpenetration of levels of time, ambiguity about narrational source or who receives it. There are some other things about this film, though, that you and I were just uh, talking about a few minutes before the show, and that includes um, uh, the, the music. Yes. Now, before I let you say anything about it, I, 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 uh, I would like to say that uh, you, you say in some of your writings, the way in which you've linked through absolutely uh, confirmed biographical sources, the way in which Garcia Marquez has, ad has adopted the principles of Bella Bartok yes. for compositionally, et cetera. So these are, uh, these are genuine analogies yes. in cases. So, music in this film, let it rip. <laughs> well, what was obvious about the soundtrack to this film is the use of European atonality, which was riding high at the time. In the late 50s, early 60s, atonal atonalism was considered the classical music of Europe. So that is one way in which this film uh, fits the temper of the times and also Europeanizes itself, so to speak, by having a reputable atonal music. It's very good music uh, in, in that style. It, it inserts itself within that tradition of, of, of European musical art. And uh, it, it was interesting, that kind of music. At the time also, there were several Argentinian uh, 12-tone composers and electronic composers that had a lot of reputation, Mario Davidovich, right. Mauricio Cajel, and uh, I, I'm not aware of, the, I forgot the name of the composer of, of the soundtrack of this movie, but I, I recognize it as a kind of uh, fashionable atonality of the late 50s, early 60s. It, it was very crafted. I, w I was impressed with it. Well, uh, this brings up a, a, a kind of larger issue, and that is this uh, ambivalence that Argentines themselves, you know, talk about. I'm not, I, I'm not yes. trying to be the outsider here about the, the identity right. of the Argentine um, artists. What is the model for that, um, uh, for, for that identity? Yes. Uh, what do you think, and we'll give Gregory a chance on this one, is what, do you, what do you think is being asked for as the identity of the artist creating this work? Yes. A couple of things come to mind. Uh, we all know that the film seems heavily influenced by Antonioni's trilogy, La Ventura, Le Clisse, and The Red Desert. Uh, it has that flavor to it. Uh, it also does something, uh, this another change from the story. The Cortázar story, much as Hopscotch does, plays a lot on the conflict between, between being Argentine and Paris. Right. And there are a lot of funny little episodes of being jostled in the metro, or the concierge always brings up the mail to him and the little encounters that takes place there. Reflections on being per, uh, Argentine in Paris uh, recur from time to time. And Antine, for some reason, chose not to deal with that very much. Uh, the only Parisian character he deals with is the, the workmate at, uh, uh, at, at the, the advertising firm uh, and the woman at the travel agency. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's a Paris where they seem to be living in utter isolation. I mean, they don't even have, have uh, unpleasant encounters on the street with Parisians. <laughs> and uh, 
that, that something not that hard to do. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right, right. And uh, it, let's say the story has maybe six or seven such encounters, but there are enough to bring, to bring home the point that this is a couple of expatriates uh, living in Paris and how that affects the way they live there. Yeah, they do talk in the story a, a, a bit about how good the life is yes. here and how easy it is, how to right. be bourgeois and partake of a certain mm -hmm. set of distinctly kind of Parisian, you go to the Bois de Boulogne, yes, one goes right. to see the latest Tyrone Power um, picture following the Parisian passion for American, <laughs> uh, for, for American uh, uh, film, all, um, all, of, all of that, but they, they seem to lead a remarkably isolated yes. l life and we don't see that uh, we, we, I mean, we see him on the tram or yes. bus, uh, etc. But we don't really get that. Uh, that well, we get the feeling that they're isolated Argentines, right, exactly. pretending to be living in That's Paris, right. but they're really right. uh, uh, still in Argentina. And That's so. right. That's right. No, and for example, I think on the second page of the story, there's a little encounter there where some local uh, worker complains about the heat. And he says, "If this man knew the heat in Buenos Aires in February, he wouldn't complain." That sets a tone already of. of the differentiation between him being Argentine and Paris. Yeah. And uh, I noticed also, I, my feeling about the story was that the couple was probably in their late 20s. And they seem to be more mature in the, in the, in the, in the movie. They seem to be more, more in the late 30s. I have no idea why he did that change, but uh, it's an interesting shift. Uh, the, you know, the, that, uh, that's one of the problems uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the film to me, in the sense that there seems to be such a gap uh, between the older brother and his wife as a generation yes. and the younger and the younger son that it doesn't seem like you know the, the the kind of thing between two brothers whether it be you know 12 months apart or two or three yes, years apart right. that are somehow the same generation yes. it, there seems well th 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 that um, that's to put the best twist on that that adds to this this interpenetration of temporal levels yes, that don't make mm -hmm. uh, that don't make sense mm -hmm. um, in the film Gregory, let's continue still, though, this issue of this as, um, as, as Argentine, or this whole question of, of uh, uh, what is the identity of an Argentine artist. Now, this is not, uh, by the way, I, I hope you will confirm this as I, as I say it, but this is not an idle question. I mean, uh, uh, because this is a, a question constantly being asked, whether it be by the novelist, the, the composer, or the filmmaker, of what it means to be an Argentine artist, this being a new society, like America's, a new immigrant um, uh, a society. How do you think uh, this film, from your point of view, fits in with this, uh, this question? I don't know that it, um, it brings it up much because, as Dean said, the, uh, the story is more specific in the contrast between the two cities. And I suppose the only way we could see uh, Argentina in it would be Argentina in contrast to another situation, which I don't think we see here. At, uh, yeah. Although, as I mentioned earlier, that may be part of the, uh, the strategy of uh, making Paris blend into Buenos Aires, yes. uh, <laughs> yes. right, which is the other thing. Julio does have a story, uh, I only have a vague recollection of it, uh, I read so long ago, in which uh, it's between Paris and Argentina, but when they're in Paris, it's one century, when they're in Argentina, it's the other century. Uh, I believe that Argentina is 19th century and Paris is 20th, or maybe... Yeah, you know, I, I've read the story. It's, to it's show some, that... Something del cielo. Yeah, that Argentina is behind, right. mm -hmm. uh, that it's really in this world, but it's back in the 19th right. century. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Something of heaven, it's called. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I've, I've read that as well. What's interesting, to, to bring up that parallel, again, about narrative technique and this uh, whole issue of time in Cortazar, uh, is that that's a story that, as I remember, uh, I mean, I remember reading it rather clearly, does not have the normal grammatical markers of temporal change in it. That is, it, it, it's narrated along and you're in one place, right. and then all of a sudden, in the next sentence or so, you've changed countries and you've changed, and you've changed century. Mm -hmm. And uh, this wandering imagination of the protagonist uh, moves without, you know, the, uh, the the grammatical equivalent of the wavy screen that tells yeah. you <laughs> you're in a, a dream right. or a flashback or or um, or whatever. I, I'm curious. Let's just step back uh, for a minute to 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 Cortazar and 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 Borges. Mm. Um, is this is this sense of uh, of uh, 
of a temporal discontinuity and interpenetration, one of the, as it were, continuities between Borges and Cortazar? I think so. I think he, uh, he uh, probably, that's Julio, uh, probably wrote the novels that Borges might have written <laughs> if he had been a novelist. Right. Uh, <laughs> I noticed one thing between uh, Julio's stuff, if you notice that uh, his novels are not fantastic, but his short stories are. Okay. That's the true. novels are all based in quite solid realism, at least for uh, mise-en-scene and everything. But in the stories, he's apt to change centuries and uh, right. have uh, people living in the subways mm -hmm. and uh, dining cars on the subways <laughs> and things like that. Uh, so that I think that's, he follows the book, his pattern in the short story there. Th that is, it's quite interesting uh, that, uh, if we look at it, Borges, in, in his short stories, I mean, obviously prefers the, the fantastic uh, mode, which we <laughs> just is, is this mode of the undecidable about the nature of the, re the reality de being, uh, being depicted. But uh, Borges' associate and friend Adolfo Bio Casares, is that the mm -hmm. correct? And Cortazar in his short stories do that. And uh, a, a film that unfortunately will not be part of this series, but is uh, available on cassette for people to see, the recent um, The Man Facing Southeast, uh, directed by Elicio Subiela, um, steps into that. And after the official story, that's perhaps the Argentine film best known in the United States is The Man Facing the Southeast. Mm -hmm. And it's utterly in the fantastic of a we cannot decide whether a psychiatrist is having fantasies having to do with the breakup mm. of his marriage or whether there's an extraterrestrial mm. in the story. <laughs> 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 and and the, that very undecided ability. What, Gene, what about you and, and the, the Borges uh, connection with sort of with this kind of storytelling and also with Cortazar? Because, I mean, you're a Borges scholar and published a book on him. Uh, it qualifies you, if anything, uh, <laughs> qualifies you. Well, there's no question that Cortázar would not have written the way he wrote if Borges hadn't existed. I mean, uh, he, he, you know, like Newton said, he stands on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Cortázar learned from Borges uh, mm -hmm. in many ways. And there's a direct line of inheritance there from the, fan from the fantastic literature of Borges to that of Cortázar, where, yes, uh, one can have people traveling in time or having split personalities or, or, or their dreams becoming reality. This is something that Cortázar crystallized and made it very much his own. Uh, th there's a tendency, I think, among um, some of us, uh, not, my, not myself, of course, uh -huh. who live in uh, uh, countries that still like em empiricist notions of storytelling uh -huh. and all of that, to, to think that, well, I mean, this is, this is frivolous in, in, in some way. Now, I'm playing intentionally, yes. I'm playing devil's, right. devil's advocate. I hope we all understand. Uh, <laughs> um, what uh, what do you think this has to do with the um, this choice of mode by somebody like Borges and by Cortazar and by implication uh, somebody like Antin? I mean, he's dealing yes. directly in the heritage. What does that have to do with uh, the portrayal of of a of a, of a nation of, yes. of a history? And let's bring up the old word of the of the of the ideological right. problems of an Argentina. Exactly. Well, this is something that I've dealt with uh, elsewhere. It's, it's, to me, it's, a, it's something that's rather interesting that Latin America has not had until very recently a vital tradition of narrative realism. Uh, many people in the 19th century tried to be the, the Chilean Balzac or the Argentine Flaubert, and their novels did not work. There is, however, a viable, fantastic literature tradition in Latin America, going back to Lugones and Ruben Darío, uh, and in a sense, that seems to have fit the Latin American consciousness and the reality better than European realism. This has become a cliche in, in lit crit circles, but realism is only one episode in the history of literature. Right. Uh, but in fact, non-realism uh, has been is much older in the form of fairy tale, folk myth, epic, where you have uh, very commonplace uh, transitions between between reality and fantasy. So we might say that, in a sense, the Latin American uh, tradition of fantasy is older and right. has a longer, a longer history than realism. And of course, the, there's also this fact that, uh, yes, in the in beginning of the 19th century, fantastic literature was on the margins. People like Poe or 
uh, even the fantastical writings of Balzac or James are considered somehow on the margins right. of their work. And yet, in this century, fantastical literature, beginning with Kafka, begins to claim a place for its own and to become an alternative tradition to realism. And now, they are, you might say, equal. They are uh, uh, equal, equal rivals now in how one writes fiction and how one makes movies, too, for that matter. Uh, and Antin recognized that in his playing back and forth with time in the movie. Well, uh, just to follow up on that, uh, just for one second, um, one thinks of something like um, uh, a, a Stephen King. Yes. And the fact is that uh, if you, in, in lit crit circles, yes. 15 and 20 years ago, he would never be dealt with yes. uh, at all. And uh, now, all of a sudden people are thinking, well, he's sticking, uh, I'm, I'm not here to evaluate the, the literary reputation. I'm just describing the fact that now this shift that you're talking about is strong enough that certain, uh, uh, certain of his works, people say, well, wait a minute, there's something in his narrative imagination yes. that is grabbing people, including uh, someone like a, uh, a Stanley Kubrick. That's right. Who makes who makes *The Shining*, which is a, a, a enormously popular yes. uh, commercially, and is clearly an example mm -hmm. of the fantastic tradition right. uh, in, um, in 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 narrative. Um, well, the, you know, we've talked um, for uh, about a number of aspects of this film. Uh, I had another question uh, for you, Gregory. You've got. Uh, so much to tell us because you knew Julio uh, and also you, both you and Gene know these traditions so well, but we've run out of time. So um, I'm going to have to say that if you'd like more information about this series, Cinema Then, Cinema Now, or about cinema studies, graduate or undergraduate, drop us a line. Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Well, uh, I think we end on that fantastic note, as it were, Gene. Uh, thanks for coming down from New England uh, to give us your expertise on these things. Uh, Gregory, you didn't uh, come, as, uh, come as far, but the thank you's uh, just as sincere and uh, just as broad. Um, in any case, I hope that our thought and discussion here lead you and thought to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.